Ajay Dhar and welcome to our school channel, it is Upper Public School, Gulbarga. So, once again, we are with the biology lessons and we have started with the life processes and in life processes, we have already finished or we have, we have already started with the nutrition and in the previous class, we have finished nutrition in amoeba and in today's class, we are going to deal with the nutrition in paramecium. As we all know, paramecium is also one of the members belonging to the protozoans. So, in paramecium also, the nutrition is intracellular. Okay, the digestion takes place in the cell. Therefore, it is, it is performing intracellular digestion process. So, let us now know about the nutrition in the paramecium. As the amoeba, here the nutrition in paramecium is also similar one that is it follows the following step ingestion, digestion, absorption, assimilation and lastly the adhesion. So, ingestion, digestion, absorption, assimilation and adhesion are the same steps followed here in the paramecium also. So, this is the typical structure of paramecium and the, you can look at the diagram in this video. So, you find tiny hair like projections present on all over the body and these are called as cilia, C -I -L -I. these are called as the cilia and these cilia are the structures which are responsible for the ingestion of the food in the paramecium. So whenever the food materials are available to this paramecium, so what happens, the hair like projections present all over the body of the paramecium, they push the food towards a particular opening of the body called as the oral groove. It is like the mouth of a, a human body. So this is called as oral groove and through this oral groove the ingestion of the food material takes place. Then after following ingestion it is the digestion now which is being carried out in the paramecium. So digestion in the paramecium takes place in a particular vacuole known as the food vacuoles and in the food vacuole thorough digestion of all the food material takes place then the nutrients are diffused out into the cytoplasm and then assimilation of these nutrients takes place for energy synthesis for energy synthesis later on after ingestion digestion absorption assimilation now lastly the food which is undigested is eliminated or the, uh, the paramecium gets rid of all the undigested food material with the help of anal pore. So this is also one of the opening of the paramecium through which the undigested food material along with some other waste material generated are thrown out of the paramecium's body. This is how nutrition takes place in paramecium which is following ingestion process through oral group with the help of hair neck projections called as a cilia. Then digested in food vacuum. After digestion process, absorption of nutrients in the cytoplasm, assimilation of nutrients for energy synthesis, then elimination of the undigested food material. So this is the process of intake of so sorry, this is the nutrition in paramecium. Thank you. Nutrition in human being. So as we all know, we human beings also have holozoic mode of nutrition. That means we need to ingest the food material, then digest the food material, then absorb the nutrients out of it. Then our cells do assimilate these nutrients for energy production. 
and at the last we need to eject out or we need to eliminate the undigested food material out of our body so under the title human dietary under the title human nutrition we are specially focusing on human digestive system before dealing with human digestive system let us know more about digestion definition of digestion and types of digestion yes definition of digestion digestion can be defined as the process of convert the process of breakdown of complex food materials into simpler ones that is the process of converting insoluble forms of food into soluble forms into soluble forms that process is is known as digestion that process is known as digestion then two types of digestion are intracellular digestion and extracellular digestion that is digestion taking place inside the cell is intracellular digestion and the digestion taking place outside the cell is known as the extracellular digestion so let us not concentrate much about intracellular and extracellular digestion we will only concentrate about the types of digestion that is two types one is mechanical digestion and the second one is chemical digestion now let us know about the mechanical digestion first then we'll deal with the chemical digestion what do you mean by mechanical digestion the mechanical breakdown of food mechanical digestion is also called as chemical digestion it is also called as chemical sorry i'm sorry mechanical digestion is also called as physical digestion it is also called as physical digestion where physically the food is grinded or the food is ground to simpler forms or easily usable forms so in the human digestive system both mechanical as well as chemical digestion takes place in human digestive system both chemical as well as the physical or mechanical digestion takes place mechanical digestion takes place by the teeth as well as that is in the mouth as well as in the stomach in mouth it is taken uh, it, it, it is happening through the grinding process or mastication in stomach it is happening through the churning movements of the stomach it is happening through churning movements of the stomach this is about mechanical digestion then coming to chemical digestion then coming to chemical digestion so chemical digestion also takes place in the human digestive system that is starting with the starting with the mouth as well as followed by various other organs followed by various other organs that is specially due to, to the activity of the saliva secreted by the salivary glands the chemicals or the enzymes present inside the saliva such as ptyalin or salivary amylase acts upon the complex food sugars in convert them into simpler forms convert them into simpler forms and it is also followed by various proteases lipases and many other digestive enzymes which act upon the food chemically and convert them into simpler forms or soluble forms which the body is capable of absorbing it so now let us understand about human digestive system parts of human digestive system before dealing with the parts of digestive system let us understand about the components of digestive system so the components of digestive system are followed with various organs as well as several associated glands followed by several organs as well as various associated glands and human digestion takes place in a long slender tubular structure called as alimentary canal called as alimentary canal and this alimentary canal exists between two openings of the body the anterior opening is mouth whereas the posterior opening is called as anus so between the mouth and anus there is a long slender tubular structure and that structure is called as alimentary canal and that structure is called as alimentary canal is this clear to you yes then next the human digestive system takes place in alimentary canal 
and this elementary canal is of about 9 meters in length it is about 9 meters in length approximately 27 feet approximately 27 feet so you can imagine or you can guess why is it so long so as we are all omnivores and we also consume food as well as the we consume the plant source as a food as well as the animal source as the food so it is very hard to digest the food materials extracted or the food materials which whose source is a plant therefore we need to have such a complex uh, elementary canal therefore it is of 9 meters in length but when you go with the the animals such as carnivores there the length of the elementary canal is very short because they are all flesh eating animals and flesh eating animals they do not require such a lengthy elementary canal therefore the elementary canal is far short compared to the herbivores and the omnivores herbivores and the omnivores now starting with the components of human digestive system starting with the mouth then the buccal cavity then the esophagus then stomach then small intestine large intestine so these are the various structures involved in the process of digestion these are the various structures involved in the process of digestion so the associated glands in the digestive system are starting with the salivary gland in the mouth or the buccal cavity then second in the stomach with the gastric glands then third one in the, the liver which is going to produce some enzyme then gallbladder which is going to store enzyme then we are having pancreas which is a dual gland both exocrine as well as endocrine gland this is also involved in the process of digestion then intestinal glands so these are the few glands associated with the human digestive system the structures associated with human digestive system are mouth buccal cavity esophagus stomach small intestine large intestine then glands associated with human digestive system are the salivary gland the gastric gland the liver the gallbladder the pancreas and the intestinal glands so together they make the normal functioning of the digestive system that is physiology of human digestive system now let us begin the process of digestion from the starting structure that is mouth so mouth is considered to be the anterior opening of your body the mouth is considered to be the anterior opening of a body then anus is considered to be the posterior opening of your body anus is considered to be the posterior opening and the mouth is considered to be the anterior opening so the the tubular slender structure existing between this posterior and anterior opening is the elementary canal now starting with the mouth so mouth is the anterior opening we have already said and it is having the cavity and that cavity is known as buccal cavity and the cavity is known as the buccal cavity and buccal cavity has two jaws one the lower jaw and the other one is upper jaw upper jaw is fixed at one place whereas the lower jaw is movable upper jaw is never movable lower jaw is movable so both in upper jaw and lower jaw we are having the teeth and therefore they are, the teeth are fixed into our jaws so such a situation is known as thecodonty that situation is known as thecodonty because our teeth are fixed into the jaws over there jaws over there or sockets over there so that is why we are called as thecodonts then the next let us concentrate on human dentation so human dental formula and different types of teeth which we are having let us discuss about them so after knowing about thecodontic condition let us understand about diphodontic condition 
So what is this diphodontic condition? Diphodontic condition means the presence of two sets of teeth that is one is known as the milk teeth which are temporary teeth they are also called as deciduous teeth they are also called as deciduous teeth the deciduous mean which can fall off deciduous forest we already heard about so so there deciduous teeth means which are not permanent which will fall off okay they are also called as the milk teeth and the second set of teeth is known as the permanent teeth which will last for several years depending upon the person it may vary from 70 80 or 90 years so on there is no particular fixed period for them for uh, the teeth so therefore they are called as permanent teeth therefore they are called as permanent teeth so that condition is called as diphodonty thicodonty they are fixed into sockets therefore they are called as thicodonty they are having we are having two sets of teeth so diphodonty then next condition is heterodonty next condition is called as heterodonty why is human dentition called as heterodontic dentition because of presence of several type of tooth over the mouth so presence of several types of tooth in the mouth that is we are having several that is four types of teeth in our mouth that is starting with the incisors then canine then premolar then the last one molar so incisors for folding food then canines for tearing then premolar for chopping down and molars for thorough grinding up of food so we are having four types of teeth that is incisors canine premolar and the molars so human dental formula can be written as two incisors in the upper jaw two incisors in the lower jaw one canine in the upper jaw one canine in the lower jaw then two premolars in the upper jaw two premolars in the lower jaw and the last three molars in the upper jaw three molars in the lower jaw so this becomes the left half part that is left half upper jaw left half lower jaw then next one is the right half upper jaw same thing and the right half lower jaw the same thing therefore we can write down as 2 by 2 1 by 1 2 by 2 3 by 3 into 2 therefore 16 in the upper jaw and 16 in the lower jaw so total 16 teeth in the upper jaw and 16 teeth in the lower jaw makes you one set of teeth that is 32 teeth this is the normal dental formula of the adults the adults but what if in the case of children so there in case of children we do not have the premolars we do not have the premolars only we have the molars only we have the molars and the dental formula can be written as two incisors one canine zero premolar and two molars so this about this is about the upper jaw and the same with the lower jaw two incisors one canine zero premolars and two molars that is two plus one is three three plus two is five five on the left half of the mouth that is upper jaw then 5 in the right half of the upper jaw then second next is about lower jaw left half of the lower jaw 5 teeth then in the left half of the uh, the lower right half of the lower jaw it is 5 teeth so totally we are having 20 teeth so totally we are having 10 20 teeth it is of children below 3 years so the for adults it is 2 by 2 incisors 1 by 1 canine 2 by 2 premolars and 
3 by 3 molars. Sixteen in the upper jaw, sixteen in the lower jaw. So this is the dental formula of adults. This is the dental formula for adults. This is the dental formula for the children. So this is all about the human dentation. Then now let us deal with the next one that is the tongue. That is the tongue. So tongue is the highly muscular structure present or attached in the lower jaw, attached to the lower jaw and it is the one which is responsible for the thorough mechanical digestion of food. It is responsible for thorough mechanical digestion of the food and upon this highly muscular structure there are many bud like structures and those are known as the taste buds and those are known as the taste buds in the different regions of the tongue we taste or we sense the different taste we sense the different tastes this is about the buccal cavity and the tongue then after this we are also dealing with the glands of the buccal cavity that is the salivary glands the salivary glands okay so these are the uh, the salivary glands the parotid gland, the sublingual gland and the submaxillary glands together make the salivary glands. Together make salivary glands. You need not concentrate on parotid gland, sublingual gland and submaxillary gland. You can only say that they are all salivary glands. They are all salivary glands and when you are chewing the food, the thorough chewing up of food is called as mastication. It is called as mastication. Along with the chewing up of food, the food is also kept moist with the activity of the secretions of the salivary gland that is saliva and saliva consists of a bio enzyme that is, that is called as the bio catalyst that is called as the enzyme that is tylin or salivary amylase that is called as tylin or the salivary amylase. So this tylin or salivary amylase which is the content of saliva acts upon the food acts upon the food and converts the converts the complex sugars into simple sugars that is why in mouth itself mechanical digestion with the help of teeth then chemical digestion with the help of saliva takes place takes place then after the thorough chewing up of food that is called as mastication mastication can be defined as thorough chewing up of food and mixing up of the food with the saliva is known as mastication is known as mastication once the food is thoroughly masticated then there is a mass of semi digested food and that mass of semi digested food is known as bolus and that mass of semi digested food is known as the bolus and that bolus will be ready to be swallowed which will enter into a muscular structure called as the esophagus the esophagus so before entering into the esophagus we must we need to discuss about the pharynx pharynx is the common region for both the nasal cavity and the oral cavity it is the common opening or it is the common region for both the oral cavity as well as the nasal cavity so you can imagine when you are suffering with the, the blocked nose that is especially in the winter seasons you, you seem to be opening your mouth for breathing in air. So how is it reaching the lungs through mouth? It is reaching through this pharynx. So through in this pharynx only the wind enters into the, the wind pipe. The wind or the air enters into the, the wind pipe whereas the food is passing to the food pipe. The food pipe is, uh, is scientifically, uh, scientifically called as esophagus, whereas the wind pipe is scientifically called as the trachea, which we will deal about in detail in the respiration concept of the same chapter. Now dealing with the esophagus. So esophagus is a tubular structure. Esophagus is a highly tubular structure and this tubular structure helps in swallowing the bolus or the 
semi digested food semi digested food through peristaltic movements through peristaltic movements that is if the size of the bolus is larger then what happens the walls of the esophagus they expand they and and they help in the easy flow of food through them they help in easy flow of food through them once the food from the buccal cavity reaches to the stomach so there at the junction of the stomach and esophagus there are valve like structures and those valve like structures are called as sphincters those valve like structures are called as sphincters at the junction of esophagus and stomach we are having a valve like structure and that valve like structure is called as cardiac sphincter and at the junction of the stomach and intestine there is one more sphincter that is called as pyloric sphincter that is called as pyloric sphincter so there are different regions of the stomach like cardiac region is the uppermost region of the stomach then the fundus that is the second region then the third one is pylorus let us not concentrate on all those structures we shall only uh, stick on to the concept here that is about the sphincters the first sphincter is the cardiac sphincter and the second sphincter is the pyloric sphincter so what is the role of these sphincters here the role of the sphincters here is to prevent backward flow of digestive enzymes and the food to prevent the backward flow of food and the digestive enzymes this is meant here then what is the role of this pyloric sphincter the role of pyloric sphincter is to regulate the flow of food the regulate flow of food so stomach is the stomach is the never stomach is never the structure for digestion of food but some amount of digestion of proteins and absorption of water of course takes place in the stomach but still stomach is not considered to be the structure for digestion stomach is the structure meant for temporary holding up of food or for temporary storage of the food we have stomach we have the stomach then in the stomach there are there is a lining of mucous membrane there is a lining of mucous membrane what is the role of this mucous membrane this mucous membrane protects our stomach wall from the acid which is present inside the stomach which is secreted by the gastric glands they are known as the gastric glands okay so therefore this human digestive system or human digestive tract is also called as gi tract it is called as gi tract gi tract refers to gastrointestinal tract like how we are having respiratory tract so here we are having the gi tract here we are having the this is the gi tract this is the gi tract so in the stomach so there are secretions of the acid and some uh, some other uh, enzymes some other enzymes which are responsible for breaking down of protein so let us now understand the function of the acid which is secreted and the acid is concentrated hydrochloric acid it is concentrated hydrochloric acid ranging from 2 to 3 ph approximately from 2 to 3 ph it it it, it is around of 2 to 3 ph that much concentrated acid will be secreted by our gastric glands okay so that concentration of acid may be harmful to us in order to protect our stomach from such a harmful acid we are having the lining of the mucus which is having no reaction with the concentrated acids then what is the role of hcl the first and foremost role of this concentrated acid is to kill the microbes which have accidentally entered into your gi tract so to kill the uh, microbes which have accidentally entered into your gi tract the first and foremost function of the hcl then extraction of proteins extraction of proteins okay so extract sorry 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 i'm sorry extraction of fibers from the food that is also the function of the 
HCl. That is also the function of the HCl. Then after this, one more function of the hydrochloric acid is to activate certain inactive forms of enzymes. Like pepsin is the active form of enzyme, but this active form of enzyme is inactive in stomach. It is inactive in stomach. So you need to activate this pepsinogen into pepsin. Pepsinogen is inactive form. Then pepsin is an active form which is a protease, which is a protease. That means what? Which is capable of breaking a protein or which is capable of breaking down the protein. So that is a protease. So activating enzyme, killing the microbes, then extraction of fibers are the functions of the hydrochloric acid present inside the stomach present inside the stomach then acidification of food also takes place in the stomach then acidification of food also takes place in the stomach here so the food which is acidified is called as chyme the food which is acidified is called as the chyme here and this acidified food slowly enters into our small intestine for further digestion it enters into the small intestine for further digestion process so here in small intestine here in small intestine before the food enters into small intestine due to activity of some hormones the liver is going to secrete uh, its a secretion which is called as bile which is called as bile bile is a green color fluid or it is a, a, a liquid substance or secretions of the liver the liver is going to produce the bile whereas the gallbladder is going to store the bile temporarily it is going to store the bile temporarily there so this bile is now acting upon the food which is acidic which has just arrived from the stomach when this bile which is alkaline in nature or basic in nature which acts upon this food material it will make this food material basic or alkaline and alkaline medium of the food is essential for further digestion it is essential for further digestion of the food material now once the secretions of the liver are done then the secretions of pancreas are also released there. Then the secretions of pancreas are also released over there. So pancreatic secretions are like amylase, trypsin, proteases. So, trypsin is also protease. Then you are having lactase, maltase, fructase, sucrase. So all these are sugar breaking enzymes. These are sugar breaking enzymes which are breaking the complex sugar that is uh, the disaccharides into monosaccharide units into monosaccharide units so the function of the bile bile is consisting of two components that is bile juice and bile salts that is bile juice and bile salts bile juice is helping in alkalization of food material that is acidic food is converted into the basic one here then the next one is bile salt what is this bile salt doing? The bile salt is having role in emulsification of fats. What do you mean by emulsification of fats? The process of converting large molecules of lipids into tiny droplets, into tiny droplets. That is known as emulsification. That is known as emulsification or emulsification of fats by the bile salt, by the bile salt. Then all these secretions of the pancreas and liver, they reach the intestine. They reach the intestine. So we are classifying the intestines into two. One is the small intestine followed by the large intestine. Followed by the large intestine. Then after this classification, we are dividing the intestine into five regions. Into five regions. Okay. The first and foremost region that is duodenum, second one is jejunum, and third one is 
ilium third one is ilium so duodenum jejunum and ilium these are the three regions in small intestine these are the three regions in small intestine then in the large intestine two more regions we are having that is colon and rectum that is colon and rectum so duodenum jejunum ilium colon rectum are the five regions of intestines are the five regions of intestine and one more region we are having at the junction of small and large intestine that is known as cecum that is known as cecum where we are having one vestigial organ called as appendix which we shall deal after finishing the physiology of human digestive system about the vestigial organ of our body so in the duodenum the the first region of the intestine what happens there the alkalization emulsification and all those processes happen in the second process the absorption takes place and that is the, the jejunum and in the ileum both absorption as well as the digestion process takes place in the ileum and we are also having intestinal glands which are also going to secrete all their secretions all their secretions which we have already mentioned that is about sucrase maltase proteases lipases and all those things they are secreted by the intestinal glands then coming to absorption process so in the small intestine as well as in the large intestine we are having many finger like projections hanging in the inner wall or inner roof of the intestine and those are known as the villi and those are known as the villi these are the finger like projections which are found hanging in the inner roofs of the intestine and these are dipped into the semi digested food and when these are dipped into the semi digested food sorry semi solid food they absorb all the nutrients out of it and this is where the nutrients are reaching to our blood stream suppose we are having the the pain in the the lower parts of our body like the digit of your leg that is the last finger or the fingers of your leg you intake a, a pain killer and the pain killer is not directly reaching to your blood but there it is passing through your elementary canal their digestion then absorption then assimilation takes place then after absorption process the medicine or the drug is reaching to our blood and when it is reaching to your blood stream the blood is continuously circulating throughout your body then wherever it is needed it is picked by our body cells or body tissues is that clear so in the intestine itself the actual process of absorption of nutrients takes place from this is where the nutrients from the food reaches to our body reaches to our body through the blood stream through the blood stream then after the small intestine after finishing duodenum jejunum and ileum now we shall deal with the large intestine and the junction of large intestine and small intestine that region is called as the cecum and in cecum we are having one vestigial organ called as the vermiform appendix we are having vermiform appendix which i have said you that we are going to deal about it in the last then the first region of the large intestine is the colon and in this colon what happens there is the absorption of few salts and water and along with few salts and water absorption there is solidification of the undigested food takes place once the solidification of the undigested food material takes place and that undigested food material is called as the feces or fecus which is eliminated out of the body through rectum which is the last region of our body and through this rectum the food the undigested food is thrown out of the body by anus and once the anus gets filled with this feces or fecal matters through the activity of the sphincters present inside the anus region we flush out all the undigested all undigested food materials out of our body so this is how we complete the process of digestion starting with the anterior opening buccal cavity
finishing with the posterior opening called as anus that is how we finish the physiology of human digestion thank you